My name is Peter Shukat. Firm is Shukat Arrow, Hafer, Weber, and Herbsman. We're located in New York City. We are primarily an entertainment firm, uh, probably geared more to the music and recording industry, although we do theater and motion picture work in addition. Um, we represent the estates and families of some of the 20th century's most famous musicians, including John Lennon, Jimi Hendrix, Bob Marley, uh, Barry White. We represent a lot of, obviously, living musicians, managers, songwriters, etc. There was a law firm looking for a young kid out of law school, and I was in the right place at the right time. And I started with a firm called, um, at that point it was called Marshall Morris and Silfen. And I was there for a number of years, and then I joined another firm, and then in 1980 I went out into business for myself. And over the last 26 years, what started out as me as an individual has become this seven-person law firm. Well, the entertainment business is, is certainly glamorous, and every kid wants to be an entertainment lawyer. I don't think there's any question about that. But in my case, I was looking for um, a people business as opposed to dealing with real estate or trusts or estates, et cetera. So the basis of uh, being in the entertainment business was very appealing. I think one, they should do it by a recommendation, and two, call somebody and try and get that person on the phone. And when you get that person on the phone, get a feel for who that person is. Uh, it's a very personal thing. You know, you can't say to a, a new client, trust me, because you earn the trust. Assuming that you're in an A category or a B category or a C category lawyer, you know, the client's going to get what they pay for. Uh, when you deal with the A category lawyers, we all pretty much know the same people. We all pretty much do the same thing. The question is, who's going to return your call? Who's going to respond to your email? Who's going to answer your question? Um, and it's really a personal thing, and, it's, a, and it's, it's like having a relationship and how the individual feels, you know, when they hire you. Well, copyright, of course, is, an, is, is a couple of areas, because one, you have two kinds of copyrights, primarily in the music business. Uh, you're dealing with a copyright in a musical composition or a copyright in a phonograph record. So if you want to split the two for a moment, you've got your copyright in a piece of music that you might sit down and write. So there's the song which you either put on a tape or put in the form of uh, a lead sheet of some kind, and that's the copyright in the musical composition. Once you record the song, you've created the song by writing it, once you've written the song and you now record the song, you have a second copyright. The second copyright is in the master recording or the recording of the song. So you have your two separate copyrights, one in the music slash the song you've written and one in the recording of that song. Now, a trademark deals more with trade names um, as opposed to copyright, which is what you have created with the song. So they're really two very distinct items, trademarks, trade names. Uh, example, the Beatles. Okay, it's a trademark. You can't go out and use somebody else's trademark and record under the name the Beatles. You could take somebody else's musical composition and with a license, utilize or re-record that musical composition, which we would call a cover record or a cover recording of the original musical composition. And they come into being separately or, or really very differently in a copyright when you finish writing the song, copyright comes into being. You can't get a trademark until you actually use the trademark in commerce. So the fact that you might come up with this great name called Kinko's, until you go out and you open your Kinko's store, you don't have your mark in Kinko's. And then when you use it in interstate commerce, you have a store in San Francisco and you have a store in Las Vegas, then you can get a federal registration on your trademark. And it's limited to various classes. You've got to use the mark in a class in order to get a trademark protection in a particular class. Well, the best way to protect the copyright is to register it. Uh, you could register with the Copyright Office. You do two separate registrations, one for the song and one for the recording. Uh, without a copyright registration, you cannot sue somebody for copyright infringement. 
So therefore, the best way to protect yourself is to register it. Although in America, this is the only country in the world where you actually register either the song or the recordings and or films and or books. But we're talking about music and, and, and records. Well, you really need two licenses. Uh, you, you start off with taking song number one, which you've created. And let's assume I've written song number two. And you want to use a portion of song number two, my song, in your song. You need a license from me. The short term that they use in the business is they call it a sample license. But basically what happens is that your song one, once you put a piece of my song two into it, it becomes a derivative copyright of song number two. Okay, So there you need a sample license or a right to use the song. If you're using somebody else's recording of that musical composition in the recording, you also need a license from the owner of the recording. However, one of the ways you get around it is that you could re-record the actual musical notes which were played on the recording so it sounds almost like a sound-alike, rather than licensing the recording itself. If you do that, then you only need one license. You only need a license from the owner of the song versus a license from the owner of the song and the recording. To publicly perform, you need a public performance license, which, which are issued in America by ASCAP, BMI, or CSEC. There are three performing rights societies. They basically grant public performance licenses to any place where a song would be publicly performed. Every place from Yankee Stadium to Madison Square Garden to the Blue Note to B.B. King's, to Carnegie Hall, the license, and to radio stations and to television stations. So basically what happens is they key the cost of their license based upon the audience that's going to come into their venue. In the case of radio stations, they will depend upon how many watts, how far out the radio station signal goes. If you're a 200-person nightclub, your license might be $5,000 a year. If you're Madison Square Garden, your license might be $500,000 a year. And the reason you need a license from all three societies is because some repertoire is owned by ASCAP, some is owned by BMI, and some is owned by CSEC. We complicate things. In every other country of the world, there's only one society. Well, a license to really produce is really a mechanical license. So if you've written the song and you are the artist for the song, technically you're granting your license yourself. To, or to yourself. Um, if you're recording somebody else's song, you need a mechanical license. The license that you need when you want to reproduce a phonograph record, and when I say phonograph record, somebody's going to probably roll their eyes and say, what's that? But I'm talking about a, DVD, a, a, a CD, um, a tape, and a piece of vinyl. Generically, we'll call them a record. You need a mechanical license. That means you're giving somebody the right to mechanically reproduce the the, 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 the. We're giving somebody the right to mechanically reproduce the musical composition on a record. For that license, they pay a statutory fee, each and every record that is manufactured and distributed. That is paid by the manufacturer and distributor of the record to the copyright owner of the song, who then pays the songwriter. Now, you could own your own publishing, meaning you own your own copyrights, and therefore, if the 9.1 cents, which is the current statutory rate is paid, you'd keep the whole 9.1 cents. If I own the song and you wrote the song because you transferred the ownership of the copyright in the song to me in a writing, which is the only way you can transfer copyright, I would keep half of the 9.1 cents and I would give you half of the 9.1 cents. 100% of the copyright is worth 50% of the money. 100% of the writer's share is worth 50% of the money. So if there are three writers, the not, your, your half of the 9.1 cents would be split three ways. You really need two licenses. You need a synchronization license, which is the right to use the musical composition in the audiovisual device. And that means whether or not it's a television program, a motion picture, a commercial, an MTV video, um, a DVD of a concert, etc. 
you need a synchronization license. It's the right to synchronize a musical composition and timed relation with a motion picture. Okay. In addition, if you're using a recording in that motion picture, you need a master license from the party that owns the recording. If, for example, um, you're doing a movie where you have a band performing live on the set of the movie, then the only license you need is a sync license because you've got a live recording of the band playing. You, of course, have to have a contract with the band, but you don't need a license from the record company, which is what we would call a master license. The other license that you require, if you're going to sell DVDs, is you're going to have to pay a per unit royalty rate for each DVD that is sold. That usually does not apply to motion pictures. Uh, they always try to do it as a buyout. If you're doing music videos, concert videos, you will find per unit royalties payable. And of course, America being unique in and of itself, there is no provision for it in the copyright law. And it's a negotiable arrangement between the owner and the user, whereas every place else in the world, it's all managed by the local performing rights societies or mechanical rights societies who collect those royalties. You need a grand license. Uh, it's similar to um, a sync license, but it really isn't. In the case of the theater, which is where you get your grand licenses, normally what happens is that if you wrote the music and lyrics for a show, and for example, if I wrote the book for the show, usually what happens is they pay a royalty based upon the gross weekly box office receipts. And it's usually keyed around 6% of the gross weekly box office. And what would happen is if you wrote the music and the lyrics and I wrote the book, then we'd each get one third for our share, meaning I get 2% for my book you get 2% for your lyrics and you get 2% for your music. In the case of, for example, Elton John and Bernie Taupin, one of them would get the 2% for the music, one would get 2% for the lyrics, and the third party would get the 2% for the book itself, meaning the script. So, But you need a grand license, not a sync license. For example, if you do a live concert on a stage, okay, you get a, a straight performing license, or what we call a small performing license, which is issued by ASCAP or BMI or CSAC. But if you're going to do a theatrical presentation, which really means with scenes, with sets, with costumes, more than just the three or four or five people or 12 people on the stage singing the songs, that's when you need the grand license or a grand rights license. You basically get a print license, and there are very few print companies left in America. The biggest one being Hal Leonard out in Wisconsin, and they basically print sheet music and folios, where a folio being that you have more than one composition in a book, and it could be a matching folio, which matches an album, or it could be a general folio, or it could be with lots of different artists or songwriters. Or it could be a folio all of one songwriter of all the songs that they've done for different songs, I mean, different albums. Um, if you want to print lyrics in a book, if you want to print lyrics in a newspaper, you need a license from the owner of the copyright, which would probably give you the owner because he's probably, would probably give you the license because he or she has probably only given the print company the right to put out sheet music. Strangely enough, there are probably only two very important issues in a, song, in a recording contract. How much product I have to give you and what kind of an advance slash royalty you're going to pay me. Your object is to take as many rights as you possibly can and as many albums as you possibly can. My obligation, or what I try to do, is to give you as few albums as I possibly can and get the highest royalty rate I can. I'm not a believer in getting a huge advance because the record company is going to recoup the advance. I would prefer to get a million dollar royalty check than get an advance of a million dollars and get a three dollar royalty check. It sounds kind of silly because it means they probably sold the same number of records, 
But when you've gotten a million dollar royalty check, it means a lot more to somebody than getting a zero royalty check. But the, 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 other than, of course, the two most important things, which how much product and what are they going to pay you and what the royalty rate's going to be, is the restrictions and limitations you can put on a record company whereby they need your approval for certain things, such as licensing the masters for commercials, for motion pictures, limitation on the right to sell a budget record or a mid-price record, which is a record which is less than a full-price record. Um, simple thing, you want the right to audit. And although in California they've recently passed laws that give you a right to audit, a right to audit, at least in New York State, is not a God-given right. It's got to be in a contract or you don't have a right to audit. Uh, record companies like to limit your right to a year. Your job as a lawyer is to try and get it for three to four years. Then you get down to the mechanical royalty clause. What a record company wants is they want to pay you a three-quarter rate, which would be, in this case, three-quarters of the 9.1 cents. They want to pay you based upon the minimum statutory rate, not if the song is longer than five minutes where the rate goes up. They want to pay you uh, not on, on record, only on records sold. They don't want to pay you on what we call free goods. They, if you have the same song twice on a record, they only want to pay you once. You want to try and get it for more than once. They want to pay you a static rate, meaning the rate in effect on the date the record was delivered or should have been delivered. You at least want to get it to be the rate when the record was released, provided that you delivered it on time. And of course, the most favorable thing is you want to be paid the statutory rate in effect on the date the record was sold. Now, you could give in to the minimum statutory rate on the date the record is sold. But unfortunately, in America, and again, only in America, and America is also unique in that you pay by the number of songs on a record. Every place else in the world, they pay a percentage of the wholesale price, and that's divided up by the number of songs. So if you've got 14 songs on a record in America, you'd get 9.1 cents for each song. If you had 14 songs on the same record sold in the UK, you'd get 1 14th of, let's say, 8 and a quarter percent of the wholesale price. If that is the percentage that the the mechanical society collects from the record company. So there is a difference. Outside of America, you you divide by the number of songs. In America, you get paid per song. Same thing in Canada. Well, limit the rights. One of the things record companies now do is you don't even have the right in certain circumstances to go and perform for television without the record company's consent. Now, I understand that the record company may not want you to go out and do a DVD of a concert that you perform, but for example, let's assume you're in a motion picture and you have a speaking role in a motion picture. Technically, under your recording contract, you don't have a right to permit the film company to take that theatrical motion picture and put it on a DVD. You have to get a release for it. Let's assume you want to perform as a sideman because your best buddy has got a group. You want to go sing one song with him you know, as a duet, as a side person, whatever, without the consent of your record company, you can't do that. So those are restrictions that when you go and you negotiate, you've got to deal with to try and get them less stringent. In so far as what does a record company do to reduce your royalty rates? Every record company takes mechanical, excuse me, they start out with whether or not it's a wholesale price or a retail price. In the case of Sony, they, take, they pay you on 90% of the sub-distributor price. Then they pay you on 85% of net sales. They take a CD reduction. And then they multiply that times the royalty rate in order to get the number of pennies they pay. Uh, if you get paid on a retail basis, they don't take off the 10% for the sub-distributor price. But again, they, dis they deduct free goods. They deduct the CD reduction and a container charge, which unfortunately at 25%, is fictitious because it probably costs only about a quarter to make the container and you're being charged two dollars. There are some companies that do pass-throughs, see-throughs. Concord Records, for example, makes it very simple. If they sell a record for $17.98, they'll multiply that times your royalty rate and that'll equal the number of pennies. So, for example, if they were going to pay you 9% on a $17.98 record, that, that works out to about, I think, $1.60. But if you've got 14% on a normal deal, less the container charge, less the CD reduction, less the this, less the that, it might still work out to the same $1.60. So the question is not the royalty rate.
The question is, how many pennies are you being paid for the sale of a top-line record? The other major dispute which artists have with record companies today is that the record companies consider a download to be a sale, and we who represent artists consider a download to be a license. The, different be the difference being, if it were a license, you as the artist would probably wind up with about maybe 30 or 35 cents for every download. If you get paid on a royalty rate basis, you probably get four or five cents. So that is a major dispute going on between artists and record companies. Uh, the, real, the real difference is whether or not the, the publishing company, EMI, Universal, whomever, Sony ATV, whether or not they're going to own the copyrights or they're going to borrow the copyrights from you to collect for a period of time. You as a songwriter would prefer to do an administration agreement so that they keep the songs for a period of time and you get them back. Uh, if they're going to have ownership of the songs, if you've got to give it up, you'd prefer to give up only half the copyright rather than the full copyright, which means that if a dollar gets earned, you as the songwriter get 75 cents because you get the full writer's share and you get half of the publisher's share. If you're negotiating a deal with a publishing company, you want to make sure that if a song is not recorded and released at some point in time, you get the song back. Uh, if you have an administration agreement, it doesn't make a difference because you get all the songs back. So. The biggest problem you've got is the way they structure what the commitment will be to deliver songs because unless you're a singer-songwriter who has your own product out, recorded by yourself, you're never going to be able to reach a minimum commitment in order to go into your next period. I have a client signed to a music publishing company that has just reached his third contract period on an agreement which is almost 10 years old. And I will name neither the writer nor the publisher. Again, a management contract is very simple. First of all, a management contract is not worth the paper it's printed on. Why do you want to know that? You're fired. The only difference is if you get fired, I may have to pay you out. But you're no longer my manager. So what's the important thing? What's the term of the management agreement? Three to five years. What's the percentage paid to the manager? Somewhere between 10 and 20%. Is it paid on gross or is it paid on net? And if it's paid on gross, are there some deductions which are permissible such as you don't want to pay a manager on your recording costs. Okay, you want to pay the manager on what you put in your pocket, not what you use to record. And the other major important item in a management agreement is, is there a sunset clause so that a manager's commission stops at some point, or does a manager get commission forever? And if a manager finds a deal during the term of the agreement, and let's assume the management agreement ends five years later, but your recording contract lasts for 10 years with the same company, is the manager entitled to records recorded after the term of the recording agreement? That's about it. How much you pay, how long is it, and what do you collect on?